Hi, I'm Dominic Power. I'm a nerve surgeon from Birmingham. This is part of a lecture series on brachial plexus injuries current concepts in management and this is talk number three. Now the brachial plexus is a network of nerves extending from the neck C5 to T1 forming the upper trunks and the divisions, the cords and then ultimately the terminal branches and the branches are the peripheral nerves which are going on to supply all of the muscles of the upper limb. Injuries to the brachial plexus can be anywhere along this course from the neck down into the upper arm to about mid-humeral level. We've previously talked about a number of topics in brachial plexus surgery. We've spoken in the first talk about anatomy and pathomechanics and the classification of brachial plexus injury. Then there's been a separate talk on the classification of peripheral nerve injury, including brachial plexus. This talk is going to focus predominantly on the clinical assessment of peripheral nerve injury. Now, in order to discuss the clinical assessment, we need to have a classification system. So just to recap what's been covered previously, a comprehensive classification system of peripheral nerve injury includes conduction block, axonal disruption and neurotomesis. Conduction block can be type A, which is an intraneural circulatory arrest, a bit like blowing a fuse in a wiring circuit. Type B is edema within the nerve. Prolonged conduction block is a demyelination along a segment of nerve. And then we have the Sunderland classification with different degrees of axonal disruption, endoneural tube damage, perineural damage, and neurontomesis, which is transection of a nerve. When we assess a nerve, we have to try and decide which of these subtypes of nerve injury is being demonstrated on that particular nerve to try and give some information about prognosis and the need for surgical intervention. So to recap, blowing the fuse is a physiological conduction block type A. It can be recovered almost instantaneously, like putting the electrical switch back on. A conduction block type B is an edema within the nerve. This takes a couple of weeks usually to settle, a bit like flooding on a railway line. The prolonged conduction block is a loss of the segment of the myelin sheath. So this only really affects the heavily myelinated fibres. And this is a bit like uh, an embankment collapse onto a railway without any damage to the railway line. Axonal injury in isolation is just damage to a railway track. When the endoneural tube is also damaged, it's like having disruption of the sleepers. When there's more extensive disruption of the perineurium, there's mixing and cross-wiring of the individual nerves within that fascicle. And when there's a complete transection of the nerve, it needs to be reconnected and all the components of the nerve are damaged from the axon, the endoneural tube, the perineurium and the epineurium. So let's put it in to the test now. So this is a radial nerve palsy. What's an important thing to state is neuropraxia is not a diagnosis of a peripheral nerve injury. Using the term neuropraxia implies a full recovery is to be anticipated, it gives false reassurance to the surgeon and to the patient, and it may result in a delay to referral and a delay to intervention in cases where it's necessary and could result in a worse prognosis. So for instance, in this case, where a patient's had internal fixation of a distal humerus fracture, and the patient wakes up from surgery with a radial nerve palsy, the diagnosis of a prolonged conduction block, which some people have termed a neuropraxia previously, can only be made after a repeated careful examination. And I stress the word repeated, and I'll explain why that is. When we assess a peripheral nerve injury, we want to take a history from the patient and we want to do a repeated clinical examination. There are other things that we would use, particularly in this case where a patient's had intervention. We'd review the medical records and the anaesthetic records. We'd look at radiological investigations, sometimes ultrasound of a peripheral nerve. And we may use neurophysiological investigations. But most of what we need in order to determine the need for surgical intervention or otherwise can be gleaned from the history and repeated clinical examination. So what we're talking about is we're trying to identify a degenerative nerve lesion, i.e. one in which Wallerian degeneration has occurred. This means there is an axonal damage 
and axonal loss or axonopathy, a degenerative nerve lesion. These patients will have flaccid paralysis and they'll have an asensate limb in the same way that someone will have with a conduction block. Although in a conduction block, there may be some preservation of the less myelinated fibres, such as the autonomic function and the C fibres. But all patients with a degenerative nerve lesion from axonal damage or axonopathy will have severe pain in the cutaneous territory of the nerve. Because they have lost the axons and not just the myelinated segments that we would see in a prolonged conduction block after two weeks, they would have autonomic disturbance within the territory of that nerve. So the myelinated fibres and the unmyelinated fibres are also damaged. We would also find that there is a tunnel sign. So a tunnel is tapping over a peripheral nerve that will result in a tingle experienced in the territory of that nerve. Now, if that nerve is non-progressive, so the tunnel on repeated examination does not move distally down the arm, that can imply a more severe degenerative nerve lesion that may require surgical intervention. So the important facts here are pain. An assessment must be made of pain. We use pain diagrams and we use neuromodulatory agents where necessary to help control pain, which can be severely debilitating for these patients. We look for signs of autonomic dysfunction and the Barrow test is the loss of friction when passing a Barrow over the tip of a finger that occurs when the skin is dehydrated and it's not sweating. Normally friction occurs because of sweat and moisture within the skin. When there is a degenerative nerve lesion and the axons have been lost, including the unmyelinated autonomic fibres, the skin becomes erythematous because of vasodilatation and it rapidly dries out and can become cracked and can develop trophic changes. So this is a classic example. If you look at the right hand of this man who was unfortunately involved in a tractional injury to his brachial plexus, he presented with numbness in his hand, predominantly in the median nerve territory, and he had a carpal tunnel decompression because it was thought perhaps this was an acute carpal tunnel syndrome. But you can see the extensive change within the hand with erythema and dry, thick skin. And this is pathognomonic of a axonal injury where there is injury to the autonomic fibres and this cannot be a conduction block and this is actually someone who's got a severe axonal injury affecting their lateral cord and the lateral head of their median nerve. So just to emphasize the point, a peripheral nerve carries multiple different fiber types, fast twitch fibers, motor fibers, pain, mechanoreceptors, and also autonomic fibers. The larger the fiber, the more likely it is to be myelinated to aid the speed of conduction. Conduction blocks and prolonged conduction blocks resulting in segmental demyelination will preferentially pick off the myelinated fibers producing flaccid paralysis but without significant loss of deep pain and no autonomic loss. When there is autonomic loss and loss of all modalities of pain this implies a much deeper nerve lesion with axonal injury and the so-called degenerative nerve lesion. Tunnel or the Tunnel Hoffman sign was described at a similar time by Tunnel in France and Hoffman in Germany. Tunnel sign is elicited by starting distally on the nerve under test and tapping lightly along the course of the nerve with a single finger. The positive Tunnel is a sign of axonopathy or a degenerative nerve lesion and the Tunnel is elicited at the point of nerve injury acutely and if the nerve is in continuity the tunnel can be progressively found more distally in the arm and the distance of re between the two tunnels is the length of axonal nerve regenerating front and that can give some ideas to the complexity of that nerve injury and how much internal damage there is. A non-progressive tunnel suggests that the nerve is either torn in neurotomesis injury or a high-grade axonal injury with formation of a neuroma in continuity. This is probably the most important slide when assessing peripheral nerves. The neuropraxic type injury or the conduction block is actually an injury that occurs 
with loss of conduction but without a tenel sign because there is no axonopathy. Recovery is usually complete and it's up to 12 weeks depending on the degree of conduction block. Surgery is not usually necessary but it must be mentioned that a nerve lesion may deepen under observation, particularly in the presence of expanding hematomas uh, and displaced fracture fragments, and a conduction block injury can progress to axonal degenerative neuropathy if not dealt with promptly in some cases. The axontomesis injury is demonstrated by presence of a tenel sign. The recovery in a low-grade axonal injury is almost complete Recovery is always more than one millimeter a day, often up to four millimeters per day, and no surgery is necessary. When the axonal injury is more severe and there is disruption of the endoneural tubes, the type three injury, the recovery is more variable. There is the potential for mismatch between motor and sensory axons that are recovering, and the rates of regeneration are lower at between one and two millimeters per day. Occasionally surgery is necessary, particularly for neurolysis to release scar tissue that's hampering nerve regeneration. The Sunderland type 4 is the neuroma in continuity, a more severe nerve lesion with virtually no attempt at nerve recovery. If some nerve does try and regrow, the axon may pass through the scar, but the rate of recovery is usually one millimeter per day or less, and the tenel remains much stronger proximally at the level of the injury. This is effectively the same as a nerve transection in terms of functional outcome and surgery is required for repair and graft or even undertaking distal nerve transfers. The grade 5 injury is the neurotomesis. The tenel is always static. No recovery is to be expected unless there's surgical intervention. The reason why brachial plexus injuries are so complex is that there are often multiple nerve injuries coexisting within one patient with different grades of injury at different levels. So there may be an avulsion, there may be a rupture, and there may be conduction block, axonal injury, or neurontomesis in the intact nerves. There are often associated injuries which take precedence in terms of treatment, such as head injuries, chest and abdomen, but there are often other associated injuries that may require intervention sooner, such as an injury to the main vascular tree at the root of the arm. Untreated, patients may have ischemic fibrosis of muscles. If the vascular injury is not recognized, they may develop compartment syndrome, but because the nerves have been torn or damaged, this isn't detected because the patient doesn't manifest with the classic features of pain in the early phase. Joint contractures can develop from abnormal postures within the arm. Trophic changes occur with loss of skin, cracks, sometimes added, super added infection, and patients start to manifest features of chronic pain with lots of psychological sequelae. So dealing with brachial plexus injuries can be very complex. In order to try and make things simpler, what we'll do is examine the nerves anatomically and try and elicit which are the nerves that are injured and the degree to which they're injured, looking for tunnels along the peripheral nerve trunks and looking for any function within those nerves, even a little flicker. We grade the nerves under the MRC classification with zero, no visible contraction, one, flicker, active movement with gravity eliminated, grade two, movement against gravity but no resistance, grade 4 movement against gravity and resistance and 5 full power. We'll also try and quantify the degree of sensory loss using monofilaments. So that concludes my talk on assessing peripheral nerve injuries. The next talk will be about how we use investigations to help support our clinical diagnosis and guide the need for intervention surgically. Thank you.